And as you are able and turn and face the cross, Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord be with you. And also Let us pray. Merciful God, the fountain of living water, you quench our thirst and wash away our sin. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows with the beauty of your truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Good morning, faithful ones, those of you who are here and those of you who have joined us online. It is always good to welcome you to the worship of God here at St. John's. Our announcements are the ones that you have heard weekly. Our midweek activities continue with supper in um, Ritchie Hall and then a Lenten prayer service at 6.30. If you have not had an opportunity to join us for either of those activities, I encourage you to try to find a place in your calendar on a Wednesday evening to do so. I also want to invite you to remember those from our church and their friends and loved ones who are touring the Holy Land this week, particularly as they travel through Palestine. Today was the day that Pastor jo James formally signed the covenant at Bethlehem Lutheran Church acknowledging the partnership that we have. Many of you may have been here several years ago when it was signed at this location and through the course of delayed travel, this has been the day that it is signed there at Bethlehem Church. Please remember them as they continue to travel for safe passage, for good health, and for the bonds of Christian fellowship that um, are forming as they share this wonderful experience together. Let us continue the worship of God through the reading of God's Word. A reading from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, 
Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be there standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God.
I invite you to stand as we read the gospel lesson. The gospel today is taken from the fourth chapter of John. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to, her, to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty again or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. And many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I had ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I want to say thanks to the to the choir and Janie and Kim and Mark for uh, carrying on so well this morning while we miss Rob and we look forward to having Rob back with us. It uh, gives him a little chance to continue to recover and be back with us. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
Well, I couldn't have ordered up a more appropriate day for uh, talking about water, could I? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> because water is central in today's conversation between Jesus and the, and the unnamed Samaritan woman there at Jacob's well in the, the town we know today as Shechem. And we all know something about water, don't we? Maybe it's general things like water covers 70% of the earth's surface or that the Nile River is the world's longest river. But I learned some interesting facts about water this week. There's the same amount of water on earth now as there was in the beginning when earth was formed. In fact, some scientists estimate some water molecules to be as old as 4.6 billion. That's a B, billion years old. Wow, I didn't know that. Nearly 97% of the water, Earth's water, is salty or otherwise undrinkable. 2% is frozen in the ice caps and glaciers, leaving 1% for human use, drinking, agriculture, manufacturing, all that stuff. 1%, no wonder it's so valuable and needed. I also noticed, I don't know, it's like a duh moment, you know, that the Bible is bookended by water. There's two rivers. In Genesis chapter 2, after God's completed creating all of this wondrous world and planted a garden as Adam's home, what do, what do plants need? They need water. So God formed a river flowing through and out of the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2.10 says, A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four rivers. Two of them we probably had never heard of, Pishon and Gihon. But the other two are more familiar. You've heard of the Tigris and Euphrates, right? So, there. That's in Genesis at the beginning. Then in Revelation, in the last chapter, chapter 22, the seer also speaks about a river. He says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, New Jerusalem. On either side of the river is the tree of life. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes Take the water of life as a gift. The water of life as a gift. Water, flowing rivers that bookend the Bible. They flow when sin and brokenness doesn't exist. In Genesis, the fall hadn't happened yet. And in Revelation, Christ has returned in all of Christ's glory and taking care of all that sin. It's been vanquished. Sin and every evil. And Christ is enthroned in glory. And everywhere in between exists where sin is present, where the world is not perfect, where people and relationships are broken, where, if you will, the dividing wall of sin between us and God, between us and one another, has also blocked the life-giving flow of those biblical rivers with the water of life. So I focused on water, and I think this encounter between Jesus and this unnamed woman from Samaria teach us again about the transformational power of living water. We know the brokenness of sin. It's clear in our history, isn't it? it it's clear in the history of this story. The historical events between the Jews and the Samaritans the high priest John Hyrcanus, about 150 B.C., had taken an army and destroyed Samaria and their worship place there. It's no wonder those people didn't get along. Great animosity. There's great division, and Jesus just crashes right through it, bringing the water of life, living water. Jews don't go to or through Samaria in that time, but Jesus chose to travel through that land. Men don't talk to women outside their family in public. Jesus talks to this woman in midday at the public wet, the town well, and she's a Samaritan on top of that. And then Jesus abides in Samaria. 
That's the Greek word behind stayed, abide. It's much more calming and filling and rich, isn't it? Jesus abides with the Samaritans for two whole days with people that he's not supposed to hang out with. But Jesus had a way of doing that, didn't he? So in, and it's a conversation then that never should have occurred. But it does, and it's only recorded here in the Gospel of John. So we heard that story. Jesus chooses to travel through Samaria, stops at Jacob's well, asks a woman in the middle of the day to draw some water. She's come out in the middle of the day to avoid others, the other women that would have come out in the cool of the day early. He offers her living water, and she hears that literally and wants to avoid the heat of the day and avoid coming early to be gossiped and hassled probably by women in the village. And then Jesus speaks prophetically. Prophetically, he tells the truth about her past, questionable past. doesn't say it's sinful or anything. Notice that, just that she's had five husbands. And women didn't have a voice in divorce back then, so... That's why it's questionable. We don't know. But she perceives from that that Jesus is a prophet, one who tells the truth. Maybe like the Messiah that the Samaritans expect, a Messiah like Moses, a prophet. The Jews, we know, of course, expected a Messiah, a conquering hero like David. So a prophet. Wow, maybe this is the Savior of the world. So she runs to tell her village, and they come out to see for themselves, and they all believe that Jesus is the one, the Savior they're waiting on. But like Nicodemus in last Sunday's sermon from John 3, the Samaritan woman thinks concretely when Jesus engages her in a conversation about water because in her mind she just wants to avoid a daily hassle. She doesn't understand what living water is. She just doesn't want to come out to keep drawing water. And other than recognizing that this living water is spiritual, it's not physical, I wasn't sure I grasped it. And I still fully don't. But I've been thinking a lot about that this week. And, and kind of, here's kind of where I've settled, at least for now. Living water brings transformation. It changes what it encounters. Living water brings transformation, change. In nature, we learn that by observation, don't we? We know that it's flowing water that sustains life, not the, the puddled, pooled, stagnant water. But in flowing water. That's one reason at baptism we pour water from the pitcher into the font to remind us that that living water is being poured over the person's head. History teaches us that civilization and exploration followed rivers, flowing water. People could travel on the river, drink from the river, irrigate. Animals could be fed, be watered. Manufacturing and power plants were built along the flowing rivers. Fresh water and rivers Flowing water have always been keys to human life and have shaped the development of civilization. We see water transforming creation too, don't we? A stream flowing through an arid land has plants spring up along its banks, attracting wildlife that flourish there. Think about the Colorado River, how it over the eons transformed that solid rock into the unbelievable, breathtaking Grand Canyon. Living water, flowing water, moving water brings transformation, change. Early in John, <clears throat> we see the transforming power of spiritual living water brought by Jesus. Admittedly, I'm probably pushing the envelope a wee bit, but uh, at Cana, the wedding feast, the party was about to die. The celebration, the family was going to end, the family was going to be embarrassed, running out of wine. Jesus changes 180 gallons of water to wine. The celebration becomes the grand celebration it was intended to be. 
Jesus tells Nicodemus that water and the Spirit transform us by giving us a new start, new birth, new life. Water and Spirit, living water. Jesus offers the Samaritan woman living water that transforms her already in the story. We see that from living on the fringes and avoiding her neighbors, she rushes into town already. That living water is gushing forth from her as she tells the villagers who she's met, what she's encountered, what she's coming to believe. Come and see. It transforms her from an outcast to an apostle announcing that good news as people listen and she tells her story and her testimony that maybe this is the Savior of the world. And this is the only place in John that John speaks about Savior, by the way, in Samaria. The living water gushing forth from the woman transformed that Samaritan village into a town who believed that Jesus was the Savior of the world. In that village, at least for those days together, the living water that Jesus brought transformed and healed that great rift between Jews and Samaritans. Jesus promised that the living water that he offers as a gift will well up and will gush forth for eternal life. And understand that in John, eternal life begins now and continues past this life. So it's more probably accurate to think that, hear that as Jesus, the water gushing forth for abundant life in us and for those around us. And Jesus tells us in John 10, verse 10, that he came, he says, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Living water brings abundant life. And that transforming power of this living water is incredibly important for us, for our world, for our congregational family, because we live in a broken world. We know that sin runs rampant. Daily we see we experience the effects and the damage that sin inflicts on us, our world, and our loved ones. So how might the gift of living water transform us? How does living water transform us? It began in baptism. Water was poured over our heads, the Spirit was poured into us, giving us forgiveness of sin, a fresh start as a child of God, knowing that we are loved like nobody else, like by the creator of the universe, no less. And as certainly as the Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon from that solid rock, the living water from Jesus is eating away at the sin that separates us, divides us, living water, might be flowing around us, swirling in eddies, eating away at the sin that divides us. It might be pushing us toward others that we need to forgive or to ask forgiveness of so that we might be reconciled as fellow believers in God's family. Living water might be simply washing away the dirt, the grime, the weight of sin so that we can draw closer to one another with clean hearts like we sing and ask for in the psalm. Living water generates faith as it did in Samaria. It generates passion and energy for us to engage in ministry, to tell the good news of forgiveness, to bring that good news to life with our hands and feet, to engage in ministry just like that Samaritan woman did by inviting her neighbors to believe in Jesus. And we need transformation, don't we? We yearn to live without sin. We yearn to live in the Garden of Eden again or at the end when Christ returns like those rivers in Genesis and Revelation. But the reality is we are mired in between those two times. And the debris of sin in our life, in the world, in our communities has so piled up, it's congested the living water of those rivers 
the living water that erupts, poured into us and erupts from us and through us, they are signs that the kingdom of God is near. Signs that we are doing, that the work that Jesus calls us to do. Signs that we are a, a channel for that water to flow to other people. Signs that grace, love, compassion, healing, and restoration, those things are happening even now in this place of wilderness for us in our lives. The living water that Jesus offers us is precisely what we need in this wilderness time. As Jesus told the Samaritan woman, the water that I will give will become in them, in us, a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, to abundant life now. We've had the water of baptism poured over, over us. We've had the Spirit poured into us. And within us, the transformative power of that living water brings faith. It's swirling around, smoothing the rough places, healing our wounds, moving us to new places of ministry, moving us to share that good news. We can't keep it in. And as St. John's Lutheran Church, this powerful living water is flowing, is moving among us, through us, carrying us to countless opportunities of renewed ministry, of new opportunities to love and serve our neighbor with the love of Christ. We know that. Jesus promised in John 7, verse 38, he promised the crowd there. He said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. It's never going to run out. Share it. Give it away. You can't give it away and fast enough. And it'll never run out. Even though life is not without the brokenness of sin. It's not without damaged relationships. It's that living water that Christ gives us that we share, that inexorably moves us forward toward restoration, toward greater ministry, toward healing, and ultimately to that future glorious time when this abundant life that still has sin in it becomes the fullness of eternal life in the presence of Jesus on his throne. Until that time, we persist in seeking to remain near to living waters that flow from Jesus, that flow from others around us, to us and through us. May we seek and share that living water that Jesus has gifted to us, Water that quenches our spiritual thirst, that's given to quench the spiritual thirst and needs of others. Water that draws us closer to Jesus and to one another. Water that always refreshes in our mission together. Amen.
Gathered as God's people across time and space, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Holy and loving God, we pray for your church. Bless our partnerships with other Christians, especially the partnership we share with Christmas Lutheran Church. Guide the daily work of denominational and congregational leaders. Strengthen our combined witness for the sake of the gospel that all may experience your life-giving love. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the universe. All creation teems with life from the depths of the earth and the seas to the skies above. Show us ways to be good stewards of your creation. We remember those in our world who are experiencing severe inclement weather this weekend. Protect and comfort them in their distress. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the nations of the world. Topple the dividing walls that separate us from our neighbors. Bring an end to the strife among nations. Form us into your beloved community where diversity of gender, race, language, ability, and ethnic origin is celebrated and affirmed. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Be present with all who are lonely and give courage to all who are afraid. Comfort those who live with chronic illness or other sickness. Give them your living water always. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this congregation. Nurture our faith and pour your love into our hearts. Inspire our community by our testimonies to your grace in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the lives of all your saints. Their hope in you sustained their lives of faith and service. Encourage us with the hope they shared in you. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.